yeah, I guess Kevin doesn't officially have to introduce me and be like formal and stuff. I can just do it, I suppose. And since it's just a small group, do you mind if I just like pull up a chair and kind of chat? And then I don't have to like, is that going to be okay for the camera thingy? I hope so. No. It'll figure it out, right? <laughs> and you can, well, there's a million screens. I suppose you can still see that, right? So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Leslie Locke. Uh, I'm a third year um, assistant professor at the University of Iowa. I'm in the Ed Leadership Program there. Um, before that, I was um, with Camden uh, for three years at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and I was in the Ed Leadership Program there as well. Before that, I was uh, in grad school at Texas A&M. Um, I feel re really lucky to have landed at Texas A&M at the sort of prime time, I think. Um, there were several qualitative scholars there and critical qualitative scholars, particularly um, in my department, that were looking at issues of ed leadership. So I feel like I um, was fortunate to um, be able to hang around with them, to work with them, and to learn from them, and really get a good solid foundation of what it is to try to look at leadership and social justice and equity. Um, I also worked with Ivana Lincoln, who was there. Um, she was the sort of qualitative um, queen, we call her. Um, and I think she sort of liked that. I liked that title. Um, but uh, that has carried uh, quite a bit of cachet in terms of um, how people see me and my, and my qualitative work as well. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I only do qualitative work. I don't do any quant at all or any next methods, unless I pair up with someone who knows how to do that. <laughs> I'm not shy about saying I don't know any of that. Don't trust me to be doing any of that. So um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a study that um, I'm just wrapping up. But it's uh, one of those things that sort of spun off from my dissertation. Uh, my dissertation work uh, involved um, Latinas who were underperforming um, but who were attending an early college high school. And I happened to work um, in a leadership role at the early college high school as well while I was working on my dissertation. So I got to know the context, and I got to know the students really well, and I got to know uh, the teachers there, and sort of what their struggles were sort of really intimately. And since then, I've done several uh, studies with, that involved early college high schools in one way or another. And this is one of them that we'll talk about today. Um, but before, before I get to the study, I want to talk a little bit about my positionality um, and the reason why I'm drawn to this type of work. Um, I grew up in Minnesota. Um, I'm the youngest of a blended family of six, and I'm a first-generation high school graduate. So my parents didn't graduate from high school, and um, as a result of that, there were lots of challenges within, within the family in terms of um, mostly financial. Um, but the narrative within all of that was to, to all of the kids, um, but I guess, I don't know, it just I, it hit me differently, I think, because I was the youngest by several years. but. Um, the narrative in the family was, don't quit school. We don't want you to quit school. Like, look and see how hard it is, right? Like, look at the challenges that we have to face. If you get through school, you will not have to face these challenges. And so I just bought into that, um, not because I was like some academic all-star, super smart <laughs> student, and really successful in school. I wasn't. I just liked it, A, because all my friends were there, and B, because my parents really had this narrative instilled in me that I should just go. So I went, but I didn't do very well. Like the narrative, the, the what's that? Oh, <laughs> okay. I thought you went, Psst. like I was like, what? Um, <laughs> the, the narrative uh, was to, to stay in school, right? The narrative did not include you should do well in school and that will help you. Right? I was like, I'll just get the degree. I don't understand why these people are studying so hard. We're going to get the same degree. Whatever. Right? I didn't get it. And then when I got into college, I brought that sort of same narrative with me. I was like, well, what is everybody working so hard for? I mean, you can just kind of sit through and do a little bit of this and that and pass, and everyone's going to be fine. I didn't really, like, it did not click to me until I got out of college and started working and started to see, like, Oh, like it took me that long. Like I don't know why I, I was so slow to come to this realization, but it took me that long to figure out. Like, okay, you know, studying and good um, academic progress and achievement 
not only helps your learn facilitate your learning, right, but it also opens other doors, scholarships, right, connections, networks, those sorts of things. It didn't happen for me until um, I got out of college and then tried to get into grad school, and that took me a while too. I had to do some sort of um, makeup work, so I I just did community education and continuing education and all sorts of things until I got myself um, prepped enough, enough such that um, admissions committees would consider me. And that took some, that took some backup work. So it was, it's not a linear line for me to the professorate. It's very like <laughs> kind of all over the place. So um, I tell people that, um, that story because it sort of informs the work that I do now. I feel like I have a, a bit of an understanding of what it's like for uh, a marginalized group of folks to sort of try to figure out uh, what it's like to go through the education system and what it means and why you should be do why you should be investing and in studying um, and how to sort of um, maneuver the barriers that get in front of that. Um, a lot of the challenges um, for groups from um, a variety of, uh, of um, f folks from a variety of marginalized groups, a lot of their experiences are different, but a lot of them are the same as well. Um, so that's how, that's sort of how I came to um, my research interests in terms of social justice and equity and, and K-12 schooling and how leadership can better suit that. Um, when I was, and this is getting to be a long positionality statement, when I was, um, this is one important point um, that I, where I, the leadership piece comes in. When I was in 11th grade, um, I had you know, been running around um, acting like a lunatic in high school and was skipping a lot, not going to class a lot, and um, I ended up my 11th grade year with the counselor telling me, you have two options. You can uh, repeat 11th grade because you don't have enough credit to move forward um, because you skipped so much or you can um, drop out and like so dropping out right like the family narrative was like oh no you need to stay in school right I don't I don't care how you get through it but stay in school and so I was like um, I can't accept either one of those options and so I had some things that a lot of people don't have um, that facilitated um, my progress into into graduating on time um, and that was, I had a car, my grandma had given me a car, and I had divorced parents, one who lived in the district where I was, and another who um, lived in um, the highest ranked district in the state, public school district in the state. And so I got in my car and I drove to that school, and I just said, hey, this is what's happening, can I come here? And my mom lives in the district. And they said, sure. And then I ended up graduating uh, in January, they were like, oh, you have enough credits to graduate. In fact, you can graduate early if you want to. So I went from a narrative of a leader telling me, oh, no, you need to quit or repeat. These are your two horrible options. Or, or going to a, a much h more highly ranked district and say, oh, no, you can graduate early if you want to. So there's just a variety of, of stories and narratives that happen. And I'm, I'm certain that my history in that school with that leader impacted how she the options that she provided to me, right? And if I hadn't had the car, if I hadn't had another parent living in another district, and I hadn't maybe <laughs> had the experience of sort of raising myself for a few years, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have known, like I can just go down there and ask those folks, right? So when I think about the challenges folks, uh, particularly kids uh, from marginalized groups have in public schools, like I realized that I had some things that helped facilitate my success, even though it was a really weird trajectory to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I'm Leslie. I'm Tong Wan Ha. Say it again. Tong Wan Ha. Tong Wan Ha. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Well, you just missed a, a well, you got the very um, tail end of a very long winded positionality story. So now these folks know all about me um, and how I got to where I am. Oh, here it is. I know I have to change this thing. So today I want to chat a little bit about, um, about a study um, that's, again, a spinoff from my, from my dissertation. And in this study, um, I looked at um, the early college high school space as a counter space, an educational counter space for uh, women from marginalized groups. 
So first, before we get too far, I want to chat with you about what an early college high school is. Do you all have early college high schools here in Alabama? Some, some yes, I know. Okay. Yep, yep. So um, there's a lot of similar uh, formats, uh, but what an early college high school is, um, they started out um, as a Gates Foundation initiative. So Gates provided some initial uh, startup money for these schools, and now they've sort of transitioned into um, different state agencies funding these schools. So what they are, they're small schools, so 9th through 12th grade, 100 kids-ish, sometimes 125, per grade level, 9th through 12. They partner uh, with the district and with an institution of higher ed, typically a community college, but sometimes uh, a university and sometimes both. Uh, the early college high school where I worked, it was both a community college and a university. So they, they, they have a partnership between a district and an institution of higher ed. They specifically target students from marginalized groups, so students from low-income backgrounds, students of color, um, students whose um, native language is not English, um, yeah, uh, and they, they, the, the key factor in all of this is that the students can um, take the college credit, the college courses that they're exposed to um, tuition free. So there's no tuition related, no book fees, no nothing. There's no fees associated with it at all. So that's a big um, attraction for the, for the students. Okay. Also, the students do not have to have stellar academic records. So they can be your average K through eight student, yeah. So students often come in with some, some holes in their learning. Okay. So I focused on women uh, in this particular study. Um, even though girls and women graduate from high school and college at higher rates than men, they're still under-enrolled in um, advanced programs, um, both at the K-12 level and in higher ed. Um, compared to their, to their white and higher income peers. Um, and because of um, gender, and i.e. misogyny, uh, and structural inequalities, the lack of a degree impacts women differently than it does men. So that was, those are my sort of primary um, interests in focusing on women in this particular study. So I had two guiding research questions. And I, I, I'll let you take a take a look at those, um, but I was after the perceptions of women um, who were in college at the time of data collection who were from underrepresented groups about their transition to and success in college. So what did the early college high school do to help them transition successfully to college and be academically successful once there? Those are the major issues I was, I was interested in. So as I said earlier, um, all of my work is qualita uh, qualitative, and this is no exception. Um, I did semi-structured inter interviews, mostly through Zoom. A lot of these um, participants I had connections with from my work in Texas at the early college high school. Um, and I also did some uh, snowball sampling in terms of finding some, some folks from, from other early college high schools. In all, there were 13 participants, eight Latina and five African Americans. Um, the participants attended an early college high school in North Carolina or Texas, and those are the states that have the most early college high schools, um, and that's uh, related to their, their charter policies, their state charter policies. Um, but there, there are early college high schools in, in most states around the country, but they seem to, Texas and North Carolina are the largest, uh, the two states with the largest numbers, but they seem to sort of be uh, more prominent in um, the coastal states. Uh, all the students um, were first-generation college students, and they ended up graduating the early college high school with 45, on average, transferable college credits. So they did pretty well. Yeah, so they got a um, year and a half, two years down the road in terms of um, their college career, uh, and they ended up doing that for free. So uh, in terms of framing the study, so as, as I, I was going through the data, and thinking about, okay, I'm asking them about what it is about this, 
place, this high school that they went to that made them, help them be successful. And I came to understand uh, that space as a counter space, so a space counter to a traditional high school. And the way that they spoke about um, the structure within the, the schools and the culture within the schools and the opportunities they made there and the networks that they had set up there, they also saw the school as counter to what they would have been exposed to in a traditional public school. Okay. And then as such, those stories then within that uh, counter space are students' educational counter stories. So counter stories and counter narratives are um, uh, critical race theory tenants. I don't use all of the tenants within critical race theory here. I'm just using counter story. Um, there are ele other elements, but here I'm just focusing on uh, counter narratives and counter space. So if early college high schools are counter spaces, then what does an ed a dominant educational space look like? And I don't think this is going to be new information for anybody in this room, but um, when I asked the students about uh, what did they think their, what their schooling would be like in a traditional public high school, these are some of the things that they talked about. This is also backed up in the scholarship. So, so traditional public high schools are seen as large, uh, large schools with little one-on-one -on -one teacher, student-teacher interaction, um, largely ruled by white and middle-class norms. Um, they're tracked. There's higher academic tracks. There's lower academic tracks. The lower or general academic track is, is less rigorous. Um, there could be a focus on sports and athletics. I think that uh, here in the South, we know that's true. We like our, <laughs> we like our high school football here, right? Um, low expectations for students of color and students from uh, low SES backgrounds. Students of color and students from other marginalized groups are typically not represented in the curriculum. And there's a majority white teaching and leadership staff. Those are all pretty typical characteristics of of large traditional public high schools. So, as early, so early college high schools then are seen as a supportive uh, counter space, while traditional public high schools are seen as um, a marginalizing and oppressive space. So, if we collected counter stories, what are the dominant narratives then, or stereotypes about students from marginalized groups and girls and women in particular? Uh, we know that girls and women from low SES backgrounds um, and um, girls and women of color don't obtain high school and higher education degrees at similar rates as their white and higher SES peers. And there are some myths um, that are within the dominant narrative um, that hold up that narrative. And those myths are that um, these girls and women don't value education, their families don't value education, uh, they're less interested in um, K-12 and higher education than their white or male peers, and they're more interested in starting families earlier than their white peers. We know these are myths, um, but these myths support this sort of dominant narrative about um, women from marginalized groups and, and schooling. So counter spaces then. I know there's a lot of stuff on this slide for you to read. Um, I'm glad there's a thousand TVs in here so you can read it. Um, <laughs> so, so counterfeit spaces then are antithetical to traditional spaces, right? And if we think of schools, so a small, a small supportive school is counter to the large um, traditional school with less support. Those, uh, a counter space um, supports the psychological well-being of individuals who experience oppression, challenge deficit-oriented narratives about groups and individuals, their settings of spatial justice, settings of resistance, Settings typically inhabited by those um, who are on the margins, who are marginalized or oppressed by traditional settings. Um, these are empowering settings uh, where folks are safe, physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Uh, they're settings that celebrate the resilience of marginalized groups and individuals, and settings that help realize possibilities for marginalized groups and individuals. I'm gonna stop here and ask if there's any questions. With me so far? Spatial justice. So, um, in a counter space, then, right? So, a spatial, uh, it, how I see it, spatial justice sort of encompasses all of these things within sort of a physical location, right? So, everybody in this building, everybody in this, in this geographic sort of location, whatever it might be, understands particular norms and values. We are about 
we understand sort of the larger narrative and the larger systems of oppression, and we're working to push back against those. So a space set aside for to do that work and individuals who understand that work. Counter stories then um, go along um, with counter spaces such that counter spaces allow for the development of counter narratives. And these are authentic stories that give voice to the lived experiences of individuals um, who are on the margins or in the out groups. And those are folks whose voice and perspective and experience are typically uh, not heard, suppressed, devalued, or exoticized. They challenge dominant narratives about marginalized groups and individuals and reflect lived experiences of marginalized groups and individuals. Okay, so findings. So remember I spoke to uh, 13 folks, 13 women. Um, they had all graduated from an early college high school and were in uh, college at the time. So they had all completed at least one year of college at the time of data collection. And they talked about the early college high school as um, a counter space in two ways, um, in terms of structure and in terms of culture. So this in, in terms of structure, what I mean is some of the elements that they had sort of set up. This could be um, areas physically set up, or it could be um, sort of the um, rules, policies, um, traditions, ways of doing uh, within the school. And then they also talked about it in terms of culture, in terms of sort of those uh, less tangible things like um, support from the teachers, support from uh, their peers, uh, folks um, going to school with a bunch of folks who have the same background as them and look like them. Um, and um, having a, sort of a, a college atmosphere and a college um, narrative that was sort of um, floating in the air in the, in the early college high school. So this is sort of like in the air that they, were, that they were breathing. So everything about the early college high school was getting kids ready for college and to be successful there. And they really appreciated um, that, that narrative because that was something that they they thought that they would not experience um, in the traditional school. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, and give you a couple of um, examples of, um, of the findings uh, through co quotes from the participants in terms of structure and then culture. So this is Linda. I'll let you read her, her quote. So Linda's talking about the mostly about um, the sort of benefits of the small physical space, right? So the school is only 400 kids. She's only got 100 kids in her grade level, right? So those same 100 kids are going through her <coughs> through um, the four years of high school with her, but within that 100, she knows everybody, right? She's got everybody's number, she knows who to text. Even if she doesn't know them very well, she's still got a connection with them, right? And she does not think that that would have happened in the traditional high school, right? Here's Marta. Uh, we did have uh, three students identify as DACA students. Um, that, wasn't, um, that wasn't something that we were after, but it's something that came out um, in the interviews. And uh, I'll get to that at the end, but um, just know that Marta is also a DACA student, and she also talks about the structure of the school. So here, Marta is talking about the financial piece, mostly, right? And um, the lack of the 
college narrative at home, so her parents weren't, weren't going to be able, she knew her parents weren't going to be able to help her figure out this college stuff. She knew she wanted to go, her parents wouldn't be able to do it, so she's relying on the early college high school to help her um, develop that narrative. Also, she's talking about the money, right? This giant financial um, tuition waiver, right, that's available in the early college high schools is really attractive to folks and it's really beneficial, right? So she's after that. She's after not only uh, learning more about college and developing college narrative and figuring out how to do that, but also the money was going to be a barrier to her. So she saw that as her chance to go to college, um, to get some college under her belt and to um, not have the financial burden associated with that. So two structural elements there, the, the size and the financial, uh, the financial piece. So now there's a couple of things, a couple of examples about culture inside the school. And this is Baylin. She's also a, a DACA student. I'll let you take a look at her quote. So here she's talking, uh, there's a lot of things wrapped up here, right? So um, she's talking about how her teachers cared for her, right? That's really important. So there's a small space, right, where she's able to get access to the teachers. And the teachers are supportive academically, but they're also supportive socially, right? That's really important, really important to her. Um, not only did the, were the teachers supportive um, academically and socially, um, but also, they helped with the college level work, right? They were supportive of students' achievement in their college level classes as well as their high school classes. And here are two quotes, one from Melissa and one from Allison, again about the culture. So Melissa describes that sort of culture of success in the school. Everything was geared toward their, their success. The whole, everything was wrapped up in it, right? It, there wasn't a person that she ran into that wasn't all about her success, uh, and she found that very supportive and helpful. Allison um, talks about um, how the, the culture of the early college high school helped her develop um, college experiences and, college and further develop her college narrative because she w had exposure to actual college students at the community college, right? So um, she was able to interact with um, college students who were very different from her and sort of understand like, oh, this is what a, <laughs> this is what a college campus looks like, feels like, these are the folks here, uh, they're very different from me, how do we, how do we interact, right? So um, Allison talks about getting um, high school students out of that high school bubble uh, through the early college high school experience. So this is a quote that I uh, used part of it in the title. Betty, um, through her early college high school experience, felt like she was a butterfly spreading her wings. She was challenged academically, emotionally, and in every particular way. So this really, Betty's quote here really summed up um, sort of the um, the uh, overwhelming gratitude that these students had for uh, the opportunity that they, that they had going to an early college high school and the um, extraordinary levels of support that they had while they were there. Um, they were challenged academically, socially, and emotionally, and um, it proved successful. They were all very successful college students. So who cares? So why does any of this matter? <laughs> right? The so what question that the grad students probably have been um, told that they need to respond to in their dissertation, right? So who cares? What does any of this matter? So the early college high school, um, uh, in my experience through this study and through, through others, 
um, is a place for women in this study, but students in general, to focus on and prepare for college, right? It's a space that allow, it's an educational counter space that allows for creation of educational counter stories from students who are typically expected to fall through the cracks. Um, the early college high school did help uh, the women prepare for an informed transition to college and academic success once there. And as we think about school spaces, uh, we can learn a lot from the early college high schools. Traditional high schools um, can learn a lot from, from the ways um, early college high schools are structured and then uh, the culture that's built within them. Uh, that structure and culture supported the women in their edu educational aspirations and goals. And if we think about this, this is meaningful given the negative impacts of a lack of a high school or a lack of a, co a college degree, particularly for women, and uh, even more so for women from marginalized groups. It's not all rosy, right? They didn't think everything was great, even though I just told you that they, they thought everything was great. <laughs> they, did have some, they did have some suggestions. So um, the students felt like they were academically prepared um, for success and, um, at the, at when, once they got to college, but they felt a culture shock once they got to their predominantly white institution, right? Because they had gone from a very supportive place where everybody looked like them, everybody was sort of in the same situation, they go to a PWI and it's like, whoa, right? So they were not prepared for that sort of um, transition culturally to a different space. Um, they also talked about needing more courses aligned with their particular degree program interests. A lot of the students talked about um, having to take uh, particular courses while they were at the early college high school, uh, taking college courses that were not necessarily aligned with their degree interests, but more so like we need to find a, a, something for you to do during this three hour block. You need to take this class because it's offered. So there were some, there were some K-12 um, sort of scheduling issues that came into into that and um, was not always positive for the students. Also, financial issues are still real, right? Even though the students got two years of college for free, um, as well as um, uh, no cost associated with books, um, et cetera, families are still, uh, still low income. So if these students were working and contributing to the family while they were at the early college high school, now that's gone, right? Now that they're in, in college, maybe far away, that piece is gone. So that's still something that, that weighs heavily on them. Um, they really weren't sure how to, how to survive on campus in terms of how much things cost. Food costs a lot of money. Going out costs a lot of money. So um, the, the financial issues are still very real um, and they really had a hard time figuring out how to manage that. In terms of the DACA students, um, the, the three students who identified as DACA said that um, the counselors at the early college high school really didn't know um, about scholarships specific to DACA students and where they could find financial aid and, um, and other resources to support their higher educational aspirations. In fact, um, one of them was talking to her counselor and she said, oh, I'm a dreamer. And the counselor took that into like, oh, you have dreams? That's great. Not as like, no, I'm a dreamer, I'm a DACA student, like, I, you know, there's going to be some, some bumps in the road here. Like, we need to figure it out. Um, and so she was like, you know, they just don't know. They're just, they just don't ha know about the resources for us. Um, and so they did a lot of that work on their own. They did a lot of um, searching for scholarships like Dream.us and Golden Door Scholarship. And there's a variety of other scholarships that um, work with um, underdocumented students in particular. Um, but also, these three students ended up going to a private school because the private universities um, had more scholarship opportunities than the public universities. And they wouldn't qualify for, for state aid or federal aid. Yeah. So that's where things can improve. And you can just ask me questions now or you can email me. <laughs> that's all I have. So thank you for coming. I'm like scrolling up here. Can I answer any questions? Oh yeah, um, I forgot about the technology. How did get into yeah, so um, it can vary. Um, however, they're, they're they're public schools, so um, kids can um, enroll just like they would with their within their zone district. Um, however, uh, there is an application process that's kind of like a 
mini simulation of what a college application would look like. So they write an essay, they get teacher recommendations, et cetera. Um, and those things are typically not too, too difficult to get, unless, the, unless there were behavioral issues in the, in the student's history. Um, most of the time, if there's a space available, they'll get in. But they do have to sort of go through that exercise of, okay, this is, I need to go ask this person, will you write me a recommendation for this school? I need to fill out an application, I need to write an essay. Sort of, yeah. Well, they, so early college high schools, part of their mission is to focus on students who would typically fall through the cracks. So they are looking for students of color, students who are first generation, students who come from low income backgrounds, um, et cetera. So that, that's their first priority. Um, and then they will go to the next well, folks. Oh, sure. Oh yeah, they know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah, they know, they know. So yeah, there there is um, sort of a a self selection type of thing happening, right? So the kids know that they want to go to school, they want to go to college, right? They just have no idea how to do it, right? So they so they're making, you know, sort of an affirmative choice, like yeah, I'm going to give up certain things because I'm going to have to work really hard in this school, and that's okay, yeah. Um, but they know also, like, hey, I, there's some holes in my, you know, when they come into the early college high school, like the teachers know right away, like, oh, there's no fraction, there's no fraction <laughs> history here, right? So there's some gaps, but the the teachers are overwhelmingly supportive, and they understand that there is um, there are gaps, and they're going to need to work to address those gaps. Um, I did a study with. Um, working with teachers and leaders from early college high schools, and this is the part that is, is um, overwhelming for them, right? Are these gaps in, their under, in, their, in the kids' knowledge? And once the kids find out, like, oh, this person is going to help me, and they care about me, like, you know, then, you know, once, you know how kids are, right? Like, so once they find that out, they'll just walk through the wall for you, you know? Like, oh, I'm gonna be here every day after school and before school, and teachers are sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, like, could you, could you go home? And so, um, so, there, so it, it's, a, it's an unusual educational space because it's highly supportive. Um, that can lead to burnout with teachers. Um, but kids are also, once they know that they get that level of support and that it's authentic, they're there all the time and they really want to do it. And they understand that they have gaps and that they're going to have to work really hard. But once they know that they have that support, they do it. They do it, but yeah, they know. Coming in, they know. Okay, I this is this space is for me to figure out how to go to college and be successful there and get two years for free. Yeah, that's a big ticket. Yeah, and they're like, ooh, right. And they're and a lot of parents are like, yeah, that's you know, that's where you're gonna go, <laughs> right? So, so but they try to in their in their admissions process they try to sort of figure that out, like who is here because their parents are saying you need to go there and get two years for free. Um, who is here uh, that have, um, you know, because they're, you know, associated with colleges and universities, so there's typically some faculty around, right, that want their kids to <laughs> go there as well, or, you know, folks who, like, sort of get it because they're, they're in that sort of area where there's um, higher ed going on. So they, they sort of try to figure that out in their, in their admissions as, as to where is our core group that really needs, that really needs us. That some of the stuff that we do is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of what you're doing. Oh. We do this intervention and we have to get the hybrid treatment cuts. So a lot of times we don't find them. Yeah. I think a lot of it's because of that we miss some of the big things we can do. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm always mm -hmm. looking for ways to kind of try to find the middle ground. How can we take the stuff that's that qualitative and qualitative, that rich differences that we're finding, how can we take that and let that inform? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and so what we're finding is that in these community colleges, in these marginalized groups, they, they're very different. How yeah. 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 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this has been like sort of there, you know, I sort of associate, I feel like um, my educational sort of um, upbringing was very similar to, to theirs. It just took me a while to like figure out what I was going to do. And I don't think that as an, an eighth grader, I would have been like, yeah, sure, I want to work super hard in high school. I mean, I probably would have failed out of that early college high school. But, um, you know, I sort of understand their their desire for wanting to like improve themselves and get better and try and, and not knowing how to do it and not having anybody in the family that can articulate exactly how to do it but supportive in you doing it but they can't give you advice on specifically how to do it so this place does that and that's really cool um, but um, one thing that you had asked um, your original question I wanted to get back to about um, the admission piece um, some of the schools um, depending on their location and um, how many kids they have applied, they'll have a lottery as well. Sometimes they have a lottery. Yeah, depending on, they're all different. I mean, they all, they all have the same basic thing, but they're like, you know, we, we target traditionally marginalized groups, we have two years of college for free, we'll give you a lot of support. Like those sorts of things are all sort of um, essentials with an early college high school, but um, they can vary in terms of, of their admissions procedures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about those words. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you was asking about the um, admissions, do you think that sometimes, like, depending on, like, if they're like, behavioral, like, mm -hmm. they have behavioral, um, if they're um, foul, whatever, like, what kind of behavior issues, like, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's um, very sort of case basis. You know, they'll, they'll discuss as a, as a leadership team about, you know, can we handle this or can we, can't, can we not? They don't have um, very large staff, um, and so like dealing with detention and um, punishments and that sort of thing, they really don't have a space to do that. Now the kids are usually so busy that there really are not a lot of behavioral stuff. I mean, there's some, right? But there's not a lot of behavioral things because they keep the kids like, you know, busy all the time. Um, which is unfortunate because you would think these are the kids that need to be busy, right? If they're having behavioral issues and their K through eight experiences, right? These are the these are the kids that would really benefit from this space. But there is that gap there in terms of um, ad admitting kids who who may benefit because they're riskier, you know. Um, they're riskier in terms of of staff time and resources and et cetera. Um, yeah, I don't know much. I didn't study that. Um, I don't know much about that, but I do know that that if there were if there were a lot of behavior issues in the past, they there those things are heavily scrutinized in terms of their admission, which is unfortunate. That makes me sad. My question is about the so we're trying to like take some time to sort of get some things that um some things that that are worth like happening right now. I hear you. Early early college, high school. Uh huh. Yeah. Right, so they know it's a streaming web place it's instead of like um you know, like a Spotify or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's an awareness that it's an app. Right. 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 Yeah, the teachers are still, right, like the teacher pool is the same as it is in the early college high school than as it is in the traditional types of schools, right? We're still eighty percent white and female and middle class, right? Um so um what happens in the early college high school is they they come in with those same ideas, um, perhaps deficit beliefs about particular groups of students, whatever. Um, but they, um, those things, in my experience um, and in my, in my data, those things change as um, those teachers and leaders work with the students and realize like they really are motivated. Um, parents are not coming to conferences because they're at work. Uh, things like that, not because they don't care, they're actually working. Um, and so those sorts of deficit perspectives change, right? When, uh, when they see kids that, uh, kids are actually motivated, right? If you give them enough to do and you challenge them, they will do it. 
Um, and so those, so those types of things change, but also the teachers are so busy from the moment they get there, their kids are waiting, right, until they go to their car, their kids are practically rocking, walking them to the car, right, and, so, and they see them at Walmart and they see them at the grocery store, <laughs> right, so, so the, they are also so busy that that sort of mentality doesn't, they don't have, they don't have time to be, um, to be um, sort of, um, Neither, neither group has time to like sort of let deficit ideas um, sort of take over because they're both working really hard and um, they're really successful. So I don't know if that makes much sense. Um, how else can I explain this? Um, also, the, t the, the teachers are um, really busy trying to get students to sort of um, fill gaps in their learning. So they're, they're really, really busy, you know? So it, it's, it's like they, they just don't have time to like sort of think about how um, family dynamics or past behavior or what they look like or those types of things influence how they see the, how they, how they impact the students, in my experience and in, in the data that I've collected. Th those sorts of things change because they really are, they really are working really hard. Yeah, and when you see kids be successful, it changes your mind about like, oh, okay. <laughs> it really does, those types of things change, yeah. When you're, when, and so there's a research about this as well. Um, so when teachers see that their methods are working, right, they're being successful with kids who, they're, who they may not see as collectively successful students, they're sort of like, you know, efficacy about how they can, about their jobs and their success changes, right? So once they're successful, kids are successful, mindsets sort of change, sort of entrenched mindsets. Yeah, am I, get, am I getting at your question or am I answering a totally different question? It, it, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I go down a road. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I guess w w your data has that all kind of story, and mm -hmm. things are interconnected. So when you are analyzing your data, how mm -hmm. would you deal with that personal story, and then you find this more bigger picture, which is the structure and the just my next question. Yeah, the per my personal story, like well, my the student story. The student stories. Yeah, I'm curious mm -hmm. to ask about their mm -hmm. personal background. Mm -hmm. and how did you deal with those data? Because in, in your finding, I don't. See yeah, they're, they're not there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so in the larger paper, there is a, a sort of bio, uh, if you will, um, about each participant, a short description of each, their educational background, where they lived, and where they, um, and their majors, et cetera. Um, but in this particular piece, um, I'm just focusing on, on the, the early college high school as the as a counter space and their stories as counter stories. So that was the focus of this particular paper, right? So in qualitative work, um, you can always go back and mine the data for other things. So those stories are are there. They're just not they're just not here in this paper because I'm focused on the the transition to and the success, the those research questions that are guiding the study. I'm focused on that. Not necessarily their their stories here, but certainly they they come out in their in in the data in their quotes. My question yeah. is since things are all interconnected, mm -hmm. so how can you just focus on one area without understanding the other? So that's my when I analyze the data, mm -hmm. it's my struggle. Mm -hmm. so things so many things are interconnected. So yeah. how can I just talk about this one without talking about because if I try to talk about this one it's Sure. Yeah. Well, that's that's the nature of qualitative work, right? You have all of this stuff, yeah. right? But um, my advice to myself when I get like, whoa, I'm going like off into who knows where, right? And I do that, and I try to always come back and I'm like, wait a minute, what is my research question? What am I doing, right? Like, so to get it into whatever your, it is, 30 pages or whatever your manuscript 
allows, right? Like you can barely even talk anymore. You know, it's like 25 pages. I'm like, 25 pages? Barely got there, right? <laughs> like I'm just starting to get rolling. So um, I always try to just bring it back to the research question because that's what reviewers are going to do. They're going to be like, whoa, what, you are, uh, what are you talking about this for? We want to know how are you responding to your research question and keep it narrow. So yes, everything is, is connected, but you as the author need to um, make sure that you are um, doing justice to those sort of personal backgrounds and stories and streamlining to your research questions. It's not easy. You probably have a lot of, of this going on. It gets bigger and then it gets smaller and then it gets bigger and then it gets smaller. Right, right. So those, those things are helping, you know, like your framework, I always do this in my qual class, I'm gonna do it like my pantomime now. I'm, like you put on your particular framework lenses, right? What are they talking about that's counter space and what's, how can I frame their, what they're saying as a counter story, right? Everything else right now just needs to go to the side. Yeah. And then from there, then you split things up even further, right? So structure and culture, they talked about the, they, their, their stories talked about those two things predominantly. And how do those things, then your sub-themes, right? So how do those things sort of filter even further? Like, sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so your research questions are always guiding what you do, and your framework helps you tell your story, whatever story you want, right? But the, those research questions and the framework need to connect. They need to complement each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there there's there's so many there there's they have so many awesome things to say. You know, the, every time I read the transcripts, I'm like, oh, I love you. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're just such a cool group of, of kids, and um, they're so appreciative of the opportunity that they got at the early college high school and the support. And they're still, they're still connected with teachers and, and principals from there, um, and they love that. Um, and they get their siblings to go. They get their neighbors to go. They get, you know, they're like it's, the, you know, it's free publicity. Right. Free recruiting, yeah, because they, they did it, you know, they got the support they needed and they felt like they were cared for uh, overwhelmingly so. I mean, none of them said like, eh, there was this one, I mean, they, all of them were okay, but there was this one teacher that blah, blah, none of them said that. None of them, I mean, they were like, yeah, I mean, sometimes the college professors were like, eh, but you know, we would go back to the early college high school, talk to the teachers about it, they would help us figure out how to negotiate that, and they would go to it. Yeah, so then when they got to college, right, they just crushed it, you know. They knew, if I have a question about this, I go to this office. If I have a question about that, I go to that office. I need to sit in the front row. I need to introduce myself to the professor right away. I need them to know that I'm serious. You know, I'm, here's how I write a professional email to a, a, a professor. You know, I don't talk to them like I'm texting, right? <laughs> like, you know, they, they knew sort of all of these sorts of ways to um, sort of negotiate the space. They were, they were. Mm hmm Yep. Yep. Right. Right. And they, and they, you know, they were conscientious of that, too. They knew. They were like, oh, I'm not going to get that there. Those kids fight in the traditional school. The kids, the teachers don't care about you. You know, they had all of those sorts of things that, um, that I listed in terms of the dominant narrative. They, they knew, right? Like w one of the um, participants' moms was, um, she works in the cafeteria at the traditional school, and she was like, uh, no, you know, <laughs> I see what happens there. You're not gonna go there, you know? Like, so, you know, they, they just knew. They, they knew what their options were, and they, they took this opportunity, and it worked out. And they knew it was gonna be hard work. Yeah, it's the it's state charter policy, 
because these, these are district charter schools. Uh, and so that is the first, the first hurdle, is the, is the state charter policy, what that looks like. Um, Texas uh, has, um, and they've made some changes, they they're have a very flexible charter policy. And so there are just, I mean, there's millions of early college high schools there. I think there's like 150, something like that. And they even have like early college districts now where like the whole district is, has this sort of philosophy. But it's not easy work. It's not easy work. So the teachers and leaders work on sort of this border, right, between high school and college and working with kids who have, you know, pretty significant gaps sometimes in their, in their learning. And so that's a really interesting space to be in in terms of a professional, right? These, they're not, that, that work is not easy. It's not, these are not the easy kids. But it's, you know, they've all, they all in my data, they all talked about how rewarding it was. But, uh, one of the um, quotes from one of the teachers was like, that was, she, she ended up quitting and going to a, a less challenging school. Um, but she said, that was the hardest job that I ever loved so much. So she loved it, and, and, but just had to leave because it was just you know, taking up all her time and she wanted time with her family and felt like she couldn't give appropriate attention to her kids and her, and her spouse. So, so yeah, it's, th there are some things that can get better, right? Like more staff, et cetera. I don't think more students is the answer. I think more staff is the answer. Understanding what it's going to be like to go to a school with a bunch of people who don't look like you, <laughs> and probably and probably have uh, families with higher incomes than you. Not a lot, and I think that's a piece, that's a um, that's a gap uh, where teachers may be, may not be able to be helpful, right? Because they're part of that, they're part of that population that looks like everybody. I mean, they went to a, a college where everybody looks like them, right? And probably had similar SES, right? So. Uh, that's a that's a, sp a a place where early college high schools can you know get maybe get graduates to come back and talk about that to like hey guess what it's going to be real different right you're going to be in a dorm with a bunch of white kids that's different than <laughs> than than what you're experiencing right now so that's that's a piece where I don't think the teachers can be very helpful because I don't think they would see that experience perhaps in a different way. Or, or could or had the sort of um, skills, knowledge, experience, academic understanding to help students get be better prepared for that transition socially. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of like having that dynamic, kind of like buffer. Mm-hmm. If you come to a CWS, like you can buffer like all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that I don't know much about. I know they try. That's, I mean, they say they try. Um, I don't know that um, they try hard enough. Um, or uh, once um, teachers um, that uh, represent the students, um, either by race, ethnicity, SES, whatever, um, I don't know that they um, that it's always a comfortable work environment either. I don't know. I don't. I don't have any research in, in that area specifically. I can just talk about a little bit from my experience. Is that I know that they try to recruit. Um, I don't know that they're very successful in their methods. But yeah, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. I also think that they should have a more culturally relevant curriculum in their high school classes as well. But yes, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Right, sure. Right, uh, yeah, institutions of higher ed have certainly have a, a role to play here in terms of what our, um, our teacher core and leadership cores look like. Yeah, there's things to be fixed. That's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Fix them. Fix them, graduate students. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Appreciate you coming and your questions.